Okay, so I think we got we got a good room full of people. So thank you for for coming. Um, we're going to take the session and we're going to speak about uh, we're going to speak about DevOps, DevSecOps. Um, I'm uh, I'm Alistair Anderson. I'm from from Cybrock. Uh, we are, we specifically work on on privilege. Um, so let's let's dive in and we'll take a look at exactly some of the new challenges that you face with privileged accounts um, in in the cloud. So just a quick introduction to CyberArk, and then we'll, we'll dive into some of the more general um, best practices around uh, how we can deal with privilege in the cloud. So CyberArk, we're specifically looking at uh, the problem of privilege. We've been doing so for many years uh, around uh, privileged accounts on-premise. Uh, and obviously, a lot of you are going to be looking at you know, uh, hybrid environments in the cloud, and the, the problem of privilege still exists, uh, and, it, and it changes. Uh, we had a, a recent acquisition. We're looking at uh, a team, uh, a, a community called Conjure, who uh, develop um, solutions for providing uh, secrets and privilege within, the, within cloud environments, um, which are, are specifically dedicated to that. So we have a, a very strong foothold and community there that you can work with, that are, that are open. Uh, and you can participate, it's, it's open source. So we'll talk a little bit about the solutions that we provide um, in that. The first thing I want to do is talk about um, what changes when we move to the cloud. So very, very simplistically looking, uh, this is the, the real shift that we see. Um, whereas before, um, we've helped a lot of uh, customers and uh, large enterprises in the world deal with uh, privilege and how they can manage that in an enterprise, so you might be looking at uh, dealing with accounts like administrator accounts, root accounts, uh, and this in the traditional data center. Um, an attacker would, would need to compromise each system in individually, uh, so it's a lot of work where you move things into the cloud, you're actually creating instances, uh, like you see up here, you get instances where um, you know, you're creating consoles that can really access the entire data center. So you're actually creating um, user profiles that have much more privilege. Um, so they're much higher risk and we, and we want to protect them. So specifically things like your access to consoles. So the console into uh, OpenStack, the console into your cloud providers, into your virtual infrastructure um, has, has great power. You can, you can bring up and you can take down an entire um, infrastructure based on, based on that. So there's a lot more risks um, and we're seeing this. Uh, this is a very simplistic view. We'll get into the details, but this is basically what's happening. We're seeing like a concentration of privilege, and whether that's for a human operator, so someone who's actually putting things into the cloud and, and moving this, or whether you're doing automation. If you're doing automation and you have tools uh, like Jenkins, Ansible, Puppet, all these tools that are in there, you know, you, you've got privilege there. And if you can attack those, you can compromise everything underneath that. Okay, uh, one very quick word on um, some of the, uh, on DevOps in, in particular. I know here we're talking about cloud and a little bit about DevOps. Um, here we, we know, we've seen from the start um, of the conference, there's a huge adoption with moving to the cloud and DevOps. Uh, we're just, the one I'm gonna point out on the right here is to do with security. So we're seeing, um, we're seeing security being a typical blocker uh, into this. So, you know, while your dev teams and DevOps um, are very quick at getting things working, um, security is often added on at the end there. So we're looking really at creating something for DevSecOps where we can build in and automate security um, into the pipeline. Uh, so we're providing solutions in that, in that space. Looking specifically at, uh, you know, the change, we, we do have differences between uh, the traditional monolithic on the left-hand side, uh, microservices on the right, so, you know, you're probably looking at virtualization and containers, and as you can see, we're creating more and more instances, and really the way I see this from a privileged point of view is this is more and more instances of credentials and passwords out there. So where before, you know, you might have had, on the left-hand side, you have a server that has, you know, a password built in. You might be in a configuration file. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to need to distribute that into all of these systems, into these, these containers. And that can be, be a, real, uh, a real problem and a real challenge to actually just manage. Um, a lot of the developers and operations right now are saving things like uh, passwords and credentials in configuration files. They've got them, uh, you know, it could be in... In YAML files, it can be in, in configuration files, and they might try, try to secure them in some way. But the truth is we've got shared passwords, and that shared password problem still exists in the cloud. Once we distribute them, they become a real problem to then change. So as well as the, the quantity, you know, just the, the sheer number of instances that we need to actually manage, uh, we also have a whole new 
uh, as we see it, an IT department. So the people who are actually making um, changes is not no longer people, but we have we go and enable um, applications. So we enable um, or configuration management like Puppet, Chef, and Ansible that I mentioned before. So these are the powerful operators in your new infrastructure. And we really give these guys the keys to the kingdom. Um, it, and it's very, it's very difficult to manage. Each of these typically becomes um, a, a security island. So everyone has their own method of storing secrets. They have their own method of auth authentication and authorization. Um, and it really becomes problematic when, when you have lots of different tools that are also moving um, around. The way, the way an attacker sees this, let me skip through these. The way an attacker sees this is that uh, you know once once the pipeline's all automated, um, you, you know really as long as you're following the rules, uh, then no one's really going to be looking at um, you know if what what's going on behind the scenes. It's quite difficult. Once a shared password's out there, uh, it's very difficult to to revoke, change, and remove. Um, they're going to be looking for keys uh, to steal. Uh, they love the fact that we've got shared uh, over-provisioned secrets. So once they're out there, they're quite static. Once you've embedded it into an application, you'll find it quite difficult to change. Um, and really, they just find a whole new tool set of how they can actually compromise your assets in the cloud. So that's the way they see it. We're gonna, I want to give you some examples. Some examples of how this has been compromised already. So we work uh, a lot with, with uh, customers who've who've had breaches, uh, and, and different examples here, who customers who want to secure their environments. Um, if we look from things like the developer side, we see uh, credentials uh, in the cloud, in GitHub, posted publicly. We've, we've seen that. So even when they're sharing things like configuration files, you know, they want to see, okay, this doesn't work. I want to see how to fix it. They share them between developers, between operations, and often those configuration files contain passwords. Um, and there's, there's a couple of occasions, we'll show you them now, uh, where that's ended up on the internet. Um, you, your actual dev teams themselves who have access to these consoles, and typically once you have access to something like uh, a configuration management tool, uh, once you're in, you can basically do almost everything in these, in these kind of tools. And uh, compromising the credentials of, the, of an actual uh, developer would, would let you do that as well. Yeah, and there's other ways to, to compromise the, the whole workflow from DevOps. So once you have access to something like the whole automation workflow, you could insert your own malware uh, into that flow and have it deployed onto many servers. So automation can actually help, help an attacker. Um, and it really applies through, through all your different infrastructures. You know, here we talk OpenStack, but it, it could be anywhere. Okay. So this, this, is, a, this is a good example. Uh, this is a real example we've seen uh, where actually the keys... Uh, so this is access keys, API keys that are that are stored actually in uh, a configuration file, um, clear text. So anyone who can access this this uh, configuration management server can access the keys. Um, it's an AWS key, so not a problem for us here. But uh, <laughs> but uh, the truth is, it applies to all all cloud uh, infrastructures where you're using keys to access and provision. So you want to create servers, delete servers. These keys will, will let you do that. Um, and even worse, they're making their way into public domain. Let me just show you very quickly, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of the solutions to this, um, some of the examples we've seen. So we saw uh, back uh, last year, we saw Vine actually had, uh, had their, uh, they had on Docker Hub, so they had Docker uh, uh, containers that contained all of their keys uh, publicly available. Okay, so th this is hard-coded credentials inside containers uh, and more. So we, w we really want to be able to get those hardcore credentials out of configuration files, out of the containers. Um, Uber, again, they had, uh, they had a database compromise, and the keys to connect to that database were, were made available publicly. Um, and then even just last week, we had Viacom. I don't know if any of you had picked up on that one. Uh, again, they, they had basically entire backups set in, in the cloud, um, and they were, they were saved to, a, to a, a cloud storage that was publicly available. And inside their backups, they have keys to their entire infrastructure. So it's keys to databases, keys to their, their console, keys to the cloud access, everything. Now, Vicom were quite quick to respond. You know, they, were, they were advised, and within a few hours, they managed to actually make the changes. But often, you need to be able to think, how quickly could you change keys if you need to? If you needed to, uh, if you realize that it had been compromised, how quickly can you change them? OK, so we'll just summarize, summarize the attack vectors, and we'll take a look at some of the solutions now. Uh, so essentially, we've got within the cloud, we've got this explosion of, of short-lived entities. They all require keys. They all require secrets and identities to operate. 
Uh, we can't hard code them in. We can't have these things um, uh, be created with keys already built in. Or we'll see what happened in Vine. Someone could just steal that, that instance and they can recreate your entire environment on their own uh, land. We got the privileged automation tools that are doing the work of sysadmins. So they're ex they've become extremely powerful. Uh, and then finally, we've got these cloud and DevOps workflows, which can actually represent a new risk as well. So attackers can utilize these flows to distribute their own malware. OK, so this is the, this is the, the DevOps flow that we want to, we want to secure. Uh, ideally, how do we do this? So we need to be able to um, authenticate uh, and authorize everything in this flow. Um, and if we got shared secrets, that's, that's very difficult to do. Um, for the people, you know, we've been doing that for many years. We, can, we know we can authenticate someone with a password, multi-factor, and we're good. It could be biometrics, whatever you want. Um, but when it comes to, you know, these applications, we need to give them credentials. We want to be able to authenticate them and make sure that it's, it's your instance of that that's running uh, and that we have the audit uh, and accountability around that. So when you run your reporting, you say what privileged um, activity uh, was executed in the last 30 days. You know, we don't just have the people who logged in, but we also know what the applications were doing. So once they're out there, they should still be reporting back in and telling us uh, when they're authenticating. The biggest challenge in doing this, and this is the one that we're looking to resolve, is uh, machine identity. Okay, so we don't want to have uh, a machine uh, or a container or an application that has a static credential built into the code. We want to be able to have this, uh, this container, whatever it might be, spin up uh, and then give it an identity. Um, it's, it's a challenge to do. The way that we do it um, at CyberArk, uh, and especially with Conjure, uh, we're actually able to, um, to be able to extend a chain of trust. So um, essentially, we can give um, privileges to something like uh, a configuration management system. So we could give privileges um, to, uh, to Jenkins, for example, and Jenkins can then go and create these machines, machine identities, and individually be able to identify every container. Okay, So it's extending the chain of trust. Essentially, at the top of this chain, the top of this hierarchy, somebody needs to kick off this. So there, there's always a, a person behind this. We talk a lot about automation and, you know, even the people who want to automate everything, um, once the pipeline is automated, you still, you know, you log in, there's still a console, there's still a person who kicks off these actions, whether it's to deploy, you know, a new version of the software or to make changes, uh, there's still a person who kicks this off. So we, we uh, leverage that person's uh, authentication and have this ex uh, chain of trust, essentially. Um, so that what you can do is remove the password and the, and the secrets and the keys from uh, configuration files and, and the source code. Okay. So human users, uh, you know, here we, there's, there's still a challenge here. The, the main problem in the cloud is that typically there's some, uh, we don't have as good uh, role-based access control implemented within these tools and it's because the tool sets are so many. Because we, we showed you before how many tools there were in the cloud, you know, every single one um, is going to make you authenticate and authorize, and, and we can have some confusion. You know? um, so we're looking to have some kind of standardization around uh, making sure we know who has access to what uh, and, and should they have access to it. You need to implement least privilege. Um, and, I, and I would say that uh, certainly to, to do that, you know, typically a developer might have too much access today. So would a developer have access to the secrets and the passwords that uh, containers and your applications use, probably yes, uh, today. So they would actually see, see those passwords and they, and they could use them. Um, so the way, the way that we look to resolve this, this is how the, the attackers see our code. This is from Puppet. An example, we can see username and password in the code. Uh, we can resolve it by you know, using an API call. We can call this, as, this is through our, our REST API. We can say we can get the secret from our credential vault. Okay. So we can, and as obviously as the application does this, we're able to audit that, we're able to authenticate it, and we use the chain of trust to authenticate it. So best thing is we've got no, no secrets in the source code anymore. And that all ties back, if you can see, we, at the top you've got a vault, and you know, this, this could be um, built in any such way that, that you want. Um, from CyberOxide, we, we give you a lot of tools that are, uh, that are able to reach into things like Jenkins, Ansible, and Chef um, to already help you do this. So you don't need to build your own custom code to, to do this. Um, it's something that can be used on-premise, hybrid, in the cloud, um, and we have, we have various solutions for, for helping you remove those credentials. Let me just get back. 
okay? And uh, bottom line is that you get visibility. So you're going to have, you know, from the fact that everything within uh, the solution that the offers from Cyberarch is uh, done in code. So it fits into the pipeline. You know, you can actually um, automate the fetching of secrets, pushing secrets, and generating new ones. Um, so that can all be automated, but you do have the visibility of, of what's going on as well. So here we can see exactly who's retrieving credentials, you know, what our containers are doing, what our applications are doing within the business. Let's skip through here. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about here is best practice uh, around this, where we, where we really need to apply this in the cloud. So something that you can, you can look at doing, uh, you know, you can choose your tools to, to do this. This is the, uh, the best way to do it, though. We're looking at secure the management console. And securing the management console um, typically means we're talking about those, uh, the users who are logging in who are highly privileged. So you could look at putting them um, under the controls of something like Cyberock, which would be able to manage their credentials, their passwords, uh, and their access. So you have all uh, video recordings and access to uh, everything that's done within the management console. It's highly sensitive. Um, another way is obviously doing multi-factor authentication. So if you have users log into your admin console, make sure you're doing multi-factor um, as they go in there for, you, for your developers and everything else. Um, secure your, your cloud infrastructure. So there, there's the, there's the shared responsibility model often. So depending on which part of that cloud asset you own, you know, you might no longer be responsible for hardware, um, operating system, uh, other things anymore. So there's, there's part of that. But the part that you are responsible for, you absolutely need to secure that. So the keys to accessing servers uh, at, least at the level of the operating system and otherwise, um, you need to be able to put that into a flow and again, put them into a, into a vault and have control over who's accessing those credentials. Uh, API keys, again, they can be taken out of configuration files and source code, put them into a vault. Uh, then we've got the admin consoles and tools. So if we went back and looked at the tools that we talked about before for provisioning um, and for automating the creation uh, and everything of, of containers, we need to be able to secure the credentials that are, are managed there. Uh, and, and then finally, inside the code itself, removing those credentials. Let me show you some examples of uh, scale it, well, scalability and integrations that we do. So we're looking here uh, for, the, for the scalability, you know, on, as far as infrastructure goes, um, you know, these kind of tools can apply to any infrastructure. Um, but more specifically, you know, apart from just providing an API to, to get secrets and to push secrets, we also have specific integrations. So we partner directly with, with Puppet, for example, where there, there are specific plugins there that are pre-built. There's a community um, that builds and maintains these. So you actually have ways of removing credentials from, um, from your configurations in Puppet, in Jenkins, Ansible, Chef, all these, for example, uh, without creating something new uh, for yourself. This is a very easy way, and if you, if you are using these tools, uh, it's worthwhile reviewing and understanding where uh, you're using secrets uh, and how they're being managed right now. Okay, so you really need to get visibility of, of the use of these. Uh, I'll show you this example, I think, is, is very useful to understand um, how we can solve the, the underlying problem. Um, so here, this, in this example, we've got uh, two environments. We've got a, a test or staging environment on the left, and production on the right. You know, we, we've got lots of servers out there that are that are agents from puppets, um, and this is the chain of trust. So, you know, as as a as an operator, you know, I can I can log in, I can provide the puppet master with credentials, so I can I can provide it an identity specifically, uh, and then that puppet master is able to create on the fly. So in real time, it can create identities um, for all of our agents out here, and it can then differentiate based on policy. So we can decide what applications go into tests, what applications get, uh, go into production and get production keys. Um, and this, this gives us a layer of abstraction so that we can then make the passwords dynamic. So if we look at the, at the, the starting point, we looked at a situation where our passwords are static, they're in the source code, and they're very difficult to change. Here we're using this chain of trust to give identities to each of these that then go and fetch a secret or a password, and that password can then rotate, it can change. So as a kill switch, you, you can very easily decide, okay, this password's been compromised, you can change it, um, and you can identify every single uh, agent and container you have out there. 
if you follow the flow, uh, essentially yeah, your Puppet Master is, is being able to push out um, configuration to these, uh, these targets uh, and they'll call back in and, and get uh, an identity. So as they're created, they'll get their identity. Um, and typically we look, we're looking at these, these lasting in the, in the DevOps uh, world for, for really a number of, a number of uh, hours, you know, uh, days maximum. Uh, you know, whereas in your back when we we're looking at virtualization, we had um, we had servers that would that would be you know they would be there for months for for potentially years. So that's our example in Puppet. Uh, very similar for for Chef. Again, we can differentiate, and we're going to get uh, the, the accountability and audit uh, on all of this. Uh, and I just want to show you what that looks like in the end. So once, once you've got all this plugged in, you're starting to get visibility um, on things. Like you can see on the left here, we've got Ansible, we've got Jenkins uh, calling in and exactly which secrets they're using. So you've got an audit trail, and this audit trail is then made available in, uh, it's secured in a vault and made available in t for real-time analysis. So then you, apart from just pushing applications out with, with credentials and not knowing what they're doing anymore, you get visibility every time they call in, every time there's a new instance, you can see it here. And again, it makes those, makes those secrets dynamic. Getting them out of the source code and getting them fetched every time makes them dynamic and you get a chance to, to automate the change. I'll give you one example of, um, we got Machine Zone here uh, as a customer who's, who's using uh, CyberArk Conjure specifically to provide secrets to the entire infrastructure. It's a great example of, of, uh, of implementation of DevOps because they're, they're basically um, recreating their entire data center every night. So they do, they do up to, I think it's uh, two million secrets reads per minute. So when they go and recreate everything, they have a really high impact and they're giving identities to every single uh, uh, container that they have out there. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a high load, it's highly scalable, highly flexible, uh, and they're using that for a API keys, their database passwords, and to distribute all their secrets. Okay, So it's something absolutely scalable. Um, and, and built for for the DevOps environment. Okay, so last slide. We'll just 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 to summarize. Um, you know, we're looking at centralizing secrets uh, and being able to help you manage them. We integrate with these uh, continuous integration um, tools. So we, like I said, we have specific plugins for for Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. Um, and all of this builds into existing flows within enterprise. This is the really the most important part is that uh, the security teams already know these tools. Uh, they can get approved so you can get um, certifications for your compliance side and everything else. And most importantly, uh, it's open source so you can try it today. There's a great community out there. Um, absolutely try it out. It's free. Um, I'll leave you some references here. Okay. Thank you very much.